Whether you're diving into Dungeons & Dragons for the first time, embarking on an epic campaign of Cyberpunk Red, or just looking for a fun one-shot to pass an evening with friends, running an RPG is a lot of fun, and being GM is an exciting responsibility. If you're new to the wonderful world of role-playing though, it can be hard to know where to start. Should you use a pre-made adventure? How much planning should you do? Should you learn the rulebook inside out before your first session? And what do you do if something's just not gelling with your players? Panic not, because the Dicebreaker team is here to offer some timeless advice on how to run a role-playing session you and your players will remember for a long time to come, with minimal worry and as much of the hard work taken off your shoulders as possible. We've also asked some friends from around the world of RPGs, from designers to content creators and fans, to recall their own favourite memories of role-playing, in order to help spark some inspiration in you, or just give you a laugh. So sit back, relax, and have that notebook at the ready, as we run through 13 top tips on running an amazing RPG session. Running an RPG is an amazing experience and it's lots of fun, but it can also be exhausting, both physically and mentally. It involves hours of improvising, talking, reacting and calculating numbers, all while trying to weave an interesting story for your group. And there's also the matter of being prepared for a session, whether you fly by the seat of your dragon scaled pants, or spend hours coming up with the perfect name for every single inhabitant of the town of Far Off in the Kingdom of Fantasylandia. Whatever that is. With all of these plates to spin, it's easy to start off feeling a little bit cold. Like you spent so much time preparing for the session and building the world, you forgot to enter that world yourself. So to alleviate that problem and get yourself psyched up for the hours ahead, it's worth taking a few minutes to get your head in the game, quite literally. Before I run live shows for the Ox Venture, for example, I often take myself off for a few minutes to listen to some thematically appropriate music, maybe some Wardruner or Heilung, in order to get ready, and you might prefer to flip through your notes, or slip on a costume, or just spend a minute lining up your pencils, your dice, your notes, your snacks, or whatever it is, but whatever it is you use, it really is worth taking the time to make sure you're in the mood to hit the ground running when the session actually starts. Hey folks, my name is Colin. Um, one of my favorite tabletop memories comes from my own game, uh, the Cyberpunk Carly Rae Jepsen inspired heist boy problems. Uh, this session, the team snuck into the MoMA uh, in New York to um, retrieve the Vault of Songs um, from the upper floors. They used a gala for the grand new exhibit uh, as cover. The exhibit was on tractors. Um, Tractors in this world aren't tractors. Uh, they are actually mechs. Um, so the getaway driver decided to uh, take one for a spin and commandeered it to kind of smash through the upper floors uh, to get to the vault. The arms manufacturer who they were heisting from in retaliation uh, turned on a lesser known security feature, the MoMA, which turned it into a rocket uh, and launched it into space and directly crashed it into the moon. Um, the team escaped barely without the songs and would find out from their mysterious benefactor, who is a AI version of Carly Rae Jepsen, that they would then have to travel to the moon, uh, dive into the depths of the MoMA, uh, and retrieve the songs. Particularly if you're writing your own scenarios and campaigns from scratch rather than running a ready-made adventure from a supplement or source book, it can feel like you need to come up with pages and pages of completely original ideas. It can sometimes feel deflating to realise you've just copied a storyline, location or a character from your favourite TV show, movie or book. You might feel like you're just ripping someone off or your players will be left bored by something they've seen before. The reality is that borrowing is one of the most powerful tools for coming up with something exciting and interesting to keep your group hooked. After all, those characters, plot beats and places are memorable for a reason. No one expects you to come up with the equivalent of several feature length movies or hundreds of pages worth of brilliantly original material week after week. You're only human after all. While simply recreating your favourite story by itself might be a bit on the nose, picking and choosing ideas from multiple places and smashing them together can create something that's refresh and exciting. How about the swift sword fights of historical samurai tales taking to the far-flung future and gleaming technology of sci-fi? Oh wait, that's just Star Wars. 
You get what I'm trying to say though. Many of the most popular stories are just old ideas remixed into a new form, so there's no reason you can't do the same. As the old saying goes, good GMs borrow, great GMs steal. It's easy to forget when watching a veteran player effortlessly come up with ideas on the fly and tell stories that leave you in awe, but like any skill, learning to be a good GM takes practice. A lot of practice. One of the best ways to approach being a GM is to think back on scenarios, campaigns and moments you've enjoyed yourself as a player in an RPG. Consider what made those moments stand out and draw inspiration from them. Having said that, if you've never played an RPG before on either side of the GM screen, there's no reason you can't dive right in. After all, everyone has to start somewhere. One option is to run ready-made adventures and campaigns until you're ready to write your own, taking some of the work off your hands and letting you build your confidence on one or two things at a time instead of feeling overwhelmed. The biggest thing to remember is that you're always learning, so don't sweat any small mistakes, having to check the rulebook, retcon story beats, or just taking a minute here or there to get your notes in order. Another thing to keep in mind is if you watch actual play series such as Critical Role, Oxventure, or even Dicebreaker's own Dungeon Breaker, the players are often people who have a wealth of experience from playing in a professional environment regularly, and in some cases they're even professional actors. On top of that, many series are edited to remove rules, slip-ups, shortened silences or other such blips to make the viewing experience as smooth as possible. Don't pressure yourself to try and recreate that experience in your own games. Just as you wouldn't expect your players to be able to instantly recall the smallest of rules and details, or at least you shouldn't, your group won't expect you to be a walking rulebook and one person law bible from the word go. You're only human and learning as you go is part of the fun. A handful of sessions in with the basic rules under your belt and the sketch of your world and story, you'll wonder why you ever worried. One of the best things about role-playing games is their flexibility. There's a rule system to suit every story and every person. From complex simulations of historical combat, where you can calculate the exact air resistance of an arrow, to light and breezy rule sets where improvisation and narrative takes precedence over number crunching. Finding the perfect balance of rules and setting is key. Do you want to tell a detective story where the players can investigate clues to crack a case? Then Gumshoe might be the system for you. Prefer an intense action heist movie where chaos reigns and disaster is abound? Fiasco will do that for you in the space of an evening. Gritty sci-fi survival? Cyberpunk. Nightmarish cosmic horror? Call of Cthulhu. How about an upbeat romp for a colourful land that the whole family can enjoy? Tales of Equestria is sure to put a smile on your face, whether you're a mindful pony fan or not. Of course, you might be invested in a particular world, whether it's the fantasy settings of D&D and Pathfinder, or the tabletop adaptations of pop culture bastion, such as Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, and more. If there's a particular system that takes your fancy, you can always bend it to fit the stories you want to tell. There's nothing stopping you bringing the political intrigue of a Cold War spy story to a sword and sorcery world in one campaign, before switching it to a more straightforward hack and slash dungeon crawler in the next. Once you've decided on the game that you want to play, knowing the tone and atmosphere you want to capture is crucial. It will lead you to whichever corners of the world best suit your story. Of course, there's nothing to say that players might lead you in a different direction entirely. Hello! So, my favorite RPG moment. Oh my god, there's, there's a few. So, just in case one does not fill up your 30 to 60 second time slot, uh, I'll do two. First one is, I was playing Vampire the Masquerade, and it was one of my earlier RPG experiences. So, my character started out as a normal journalist, she toured the world, she went to Japan, that's where she got embraced, life changing experiences. In the course of the character's time, my GM had a habit of using celebrities, photos, magazine clippings for the NPCs. As a result, when my character 
finally met the Bruja Premagen to go through the ritual that she needed to so she can elevate herself within the clan. Come to find out that the Bruja Premagen for New York City was the actor Udo Kier. And if you're unfamiliar with this particular actor, he is a very well-known character actor in a lot of B-grade films. And I adore this actor. Because <laughs> a lot of the films he does is pretty cheesy, but pretty fun. So um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with him, he was, I believe, the head vampire in the first Blade movie, which was kind of fitting. So I really liked his ability to incorporate well-known characters that we knew from regular TV movies into our games and it really enhanced our experience playing them. So that was a lot of fun. Second experience was playing the Star Wars RPG where my team decided that we were going to merge a lot of Marvel characters and transcribe them over to the Star Wars RPG format. So you can only imagine the menagerie of folks that we had there. My character in particular was modeled off of Cassandra Kane, the later on uh, persona known as Batgirl. So for her, she was uh, raised by the Sith and became a wandering Jedi on her own. But the really cool thing about her character was the GM had decided that she would be the first Jedi to have the purple lightsaber, which later on, because our story was a prequel, would be later on passed down in generations to Maze Window. So I thought that, that was a really kick-ass moment as well because I love Maze Window and so for my character to be connected to that character in some kind of, you know, fan canon story arc was really, really awesome. I really enjoyed that as well. So I hope <laughs> these were moments that actually uh, fit into your time scheduling and um, that you guys also think are cool as well. So thank you very much and happy to participate. Bye. Now this one might be a slight point of contention for some GMs, but we're gonna throw this out there. You shouldn't go overboard with planning. A couple pages of loose notes is often more than enough to hold a session together and leaves enough room to improvise based on the player's actions without coming up with everything on the spot. That's not to say that you shouldn't plan at all. You should have some idea of where the party is headed, what they might find along the way, but detailing every last encounter and event runs the risk of railroading your players onto a different track than the one that they want to take, making it an awkward and even unenjoyable experience for them as you butt heads. On the other hand, writing pages and pages of notes only to chuck most of them away because they just don't fit anymore can be a bit dispiriting, even if you keep some handy for later sessions. As GM, you're there to nudge the players in the direction of the story you want to tell, but you're also there to support their decisions and tell the story that the group want to tell together. Think of the notes as the lines that the players colour between with their decisions and characters. Presenting an already completed drawing leaves them nothing to do and removes their agency in the world. Naturally, you might find that making more notes when you're first getting started makes you feel a bit more comfortable. And there might be certain stories or events that require more detail to flesh them out properly. But at the end of the day, it's down to how much you plan. Don't just be surprised if some of your work ends up on the cutting room floor and be okay with it landing there. Okay, we'll admit, we just told you not to plan and now I'm here to tell you to plan a little bit, but stick with me, it's sage advice mostly. Generally speaking, you'll want to have an idea of where things begin and where things are going to end up. And that could be over the course of a single session, an arc of a few different scenarios, or an entire campaign. Generally speaking, it helps to have an idea of where things are headed for your sake as much as the players. And again, that doesn't mean you have to have a rigid plan and stick to it no matter what your players do. For example, if they've just assassinated the kingdom's beloved ruler, having a parade thrown in their honour at the end of the session just because you'd planned to have one before they got all regicide won't really make much sense. But if you know the party, for example, will be asked to track down a wanted fugitive in the first session, and they'll eventually have a confrontation with them in the fifth session, it puts you in the right frame of mind to start planning the action of each session in a way that feels natural, rather than making it up as you go along.
The good thing about knowing where characters are going to end up, but not necessarily how they're going to get there is, you can react to the things they choose to do in a way that makes their progress through the world more meaningful. Instead of painstakingly tracking our hypothetical fugitive for five sessions, for example, the players might just decide to find out where that fugitive grew up, burn down the village and wait for them to arrive seeking vengeance. Either way is a valid tactic in terms of making that confrontation happen, so as long as you know there'll be a confrontation, it shouldn't really make a difference to you which path the players take to get there. Let the plan come from the players, in other words, and you can focus on gently steering them in the right direction. Don't sweat the little details, just bear in mind that having a notion of where you'd like things to end up is a pretty good idea. Hello, I'm Amanda Hammond and I'm the Editorial Director for Kobold Press. I'm going to share one of my favorite moments from a Pathfinder game I'm running right now for several industry friends. In that game, Alexander Sandgroom, our Director of Operations over at Kobold Press, had been playing a character who could only be described as a hobo. His first scene involved him skulking around in filthy rags, shoveling soup into what became known as his soup pocket. He was literally called Rag Heap. So, the PCs were press ganged into a pirate crew, and there were signs that pirate crew was involved in devil worship. Then, an NPC named Sandara, who had claimed to be a worshipper of the Pirate Queen goddess, revealed her association with a rival devil and attempted to recruit the PCs. That's when Ragheep revealed himself. He dropped his magical disguise to show a beautiful nobleman's outfit and a prominent holy symbol of the Pirate Queen. She doesn't want you here, he shouted at Sandara in this booming voice that no one had heard before. Turns out he was an inquisitor of the Pirate Queen the entire time, and rooting out devil worship was his entire mission. His real name was Vincenzo Latticina. You could hear a pin drop when that reveal happened, until finally one of the other players said, I did not see that coming. Of course they defeated Sandara, but after the session, some of the other players, including James Jacobs, Pathfinder creative director, and Jason Keeley, a Starfinder developer, messaged me to say how fun and unexpected that moment was. It was really fun for me as a GM too. Stunning jaded professionals who've worked in the industry for a decade, always a good moment. Nobody wants a role-playing spread so chaotic that your story falls to pieces in minutes, but at the same time, railroading is one of the cardinal sins of role-playing. Forcing your players back onto your pre-planned story beats or limiting what they can do because you hadn't accounted for it runs the risk of discouraging their creativity and will inevitably lead to dissatisfied players. Seeing where your players take their creativity without seizing the reins entirely is one of the most satisfying things you can experience as a GM. As the person with almost all the answers, having just a few curveballs thrown your way can be thrilling, not to mention allowing you to have your own little kernels of surprise. Many of the most memorable moments in RPGs come from the unexpected. Someone kicking down the door when you expect them to pick the lock, befriending a dinosaur instead of running for their lives or immediately drawing their weapons. That doesn't mean the GM can't contribute and guide the party, but it should be a constant cycle of inspiration as you react to the player's ideas by throwing in your own into the mix. Considering GMing as having the same yes and rule as improv comedy, while some things may simply be impossible, encouraging supporting your players is the most important responsibility as a GM. After all, there's a reason that things are more exciting when they don't quite go to plan. We've all been there, you've had an amazing idea for something and now you want to show it off to the rest of the group. It might be a brilliant twist on a well-known monster or enemy type, perhaps it's the NPC the party has been crying out for in order to spice things up a bit, or maybe it's a thrilling subplot presenting a mystery Sherlock Holmes himself would be proud to solve. It's easy and fun to pour your heart into fresh ideas for role-playing sessions, but all the same, sometimes those things just don't work out. 
Perhaps the fight preceding the big boss encounter took more out of the characters than you anticipated, and including that new enemy type would be cruel and unfair. Maybe that new NPC rubs the party up the wrong way, and actually they don't really want to go adventuring with them. Or maybe the players miss the clues to the mystery, or just straight up don't fancy chasing them down. Whatever the reason, if something isn't working, learn to let it go. As exciting as the idea might be, there's just no sense forcing your players through something that either doesn't work, doesn't make sense, or worst of all, actively detracts from the fun of roleplaying. And it can be disappointing having an idea fall flat, of course it can, but that's not to say you can't revive it in a different campaign, a different group, or even with the same players and characters just a bit further down the line when you judge the time to be right. A plan that goes unused, in other words, is not necessarily a plan wasted. I mean, heck, if the players didn't like the NPC that much and they remember them as an unpleasant individual, why not bring them back as a villain later on down the line? That'll teach you not to bring me adventuring. They'll sneer, drawing a sword, and looking petulant. In all seriousness, cutting something short, reworking it to better suit the circumstances, or just dropping it entirely is, nine times out of ten, better than overdoing something or forcing everybody to do it just because you wrote it down on a page. Try not to be precious about your darlings. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad ideas, it just means that they're not the right idea for right now. So I have a lot of favorite RPG moments, but I think one of the ones that stands out to me the most is a live action online game that I played uh, a while ago by Avon Woodwinder, and it's called As We Know It. In the game, uh, you're all survivors from an alien invasion and you are playing in a closet. You are literally going into a closet or a dark room and you're just texting on your phone. And the GM is uh, someone who's texting from, uh, you know, from outside the, the closet space. And they're just like, you know, sending you messages, trying to connect you with other survivors. And it created this really terrifying and intense experience like it was just so intense and it was so well done uh so yeah even to this day i would say that it's like one of my favorite games if you don't know the rule of cool it goes something like this if it's cool allow it now what you consider cool can be a bit subjective um except socks and sandals which are universally uncool and the rule of cool doesn't just mean that every character in your RPG needs to wear sunglasses, walk away slowly from explosions and be able to shred a guitar behind their head. Although, admittedly, doing all three of those together would be pretty cool. What the rule of cool generally means in RPGs is to put the player experience first. If you're caught in a decision between playing completely by the rules and allowing a player to pull up something off that's gonna energize the table like a bolt of lightning, even if it means bending the rules a bit, Consider the GM the lighting rod. Like, giving the players room to veer off the rails, this doesn't mean allowing anything and everything to happen. Taking down a stone skin giant with a feather is unlikely, no matter how ticklish it might be. And a seven foot barbarian probably won't be able to hide behind a standard sized vase, no matter how hard they try. If everyone's able to do incredible things all the time, the impact of those moments will be eroded. But applying a little suspension of disbelief, allowing players to at least attempt an impossible task with even a minuscule chance of succeeding and taking a little liberty with the letter of the rules can make for unforgettable moments. Remember rolling that 20 and landing that arrow dead on target from a mile away? Of course you do. We all do. There's a reason that the GM normally rolls their dice behind the screen. What you roll isn't meant to be the be-all and end-all of what happens. It's a relatively fair way of deciding the outcome of something in most cases, but sometimes a twist of fate can bring a session to a screaming halt. So what do you do if something you just rolled will kill the mood? Lie about it. If combat's dragging on and the party's struggling to deal with the big bad and barely making a dent in their huge pool of health, then have the next half-decent damage roll or a specially inventive attack finish them off. If your own damage roll would turn a player's character into the blood and guts equivalent of Hummus, knock it down a few points and allow the party to rush to their aid. If a failed perception roll would leave the group spending a frustrating 20 minutes searching the clues, 
give them a hint that they wouldn't have got if they stuck exactly to the rules. On the other hand, if the main monster of a dungeon is likely to be off in the space for a few rounds, maybe bump up their hit points a little, step up their attacks, or even have them take on a surprise second form when their health hits zero, like a video game boss. Like deploying the rule of cool, this is a GM power that should be used sparingly. You don't want fights to feel like a cakewalk or the danger of exploring a dungeon to be laughed at by a seemingly invincible party. There are rules for a reason after all, and things are generally balanced to allow for a fair challenge. But a little fudging of roles never hurt anyone. In fact, it can make the game much better. Hey everybody, I'm Stuart Wellington from the Flophouse Podcast. The role-playing game story I'd like to share today uh, is from a recent campaign of Apocalypse World, where I've been running a large group of friends uh, through the game. We've been playing at our friend Stephen Val's apartment, and Steve has been playing the hard holder named Dazed, which is what he names all of his role-playing game characters. Now, Dazed the hard holder is kind of like a post-apocalyptic mayor. And over the course of the campaign, he made a bunch of enemies, and a group of PCs and NPCs got together and ousted him from his position. Now, Dazed had to go on a soul-seeking journey after that, and it kind of ended when a bunch of raiders uh, shot him in the face. Now, before the next session, I sat down with Steve and talked about the future of Days, and he decided to change his character's playbook from Hardholder over to a thing called the Faceless, which is a hulking brute who wears a mask like Jason Voorhees. Now, he decided to also change Days' name to Durzo, uh, which was new to everybody, and he played him kind of like he ledgers the Joker if he subsisted only on monster energy drink and, I don't know, cocaine. Now, Durzo introduced himself by, of course, saying, I'm Durzo! And the look on Val's face was one of such extreme displeasure, and all she could say was, I hate this. And you know what? That's the best role-playing game character I've ever seen. Now, that is Durzo's mask. Cheers, everybody. Role-playing games may deal with fictional worlds and characters a lot of the time, but they can have a very real effect on the actual people playing them. Before your game begins, while you're playing and afterwards, you should ensure that everyone is comfortable around the table. Just as they are in real life, safety, comfort and consent are absolutely key when role-playing. There are a number of excellent safety tools available for free to help you ensure that nothing runs the risk of hurting or upsetting anyone in your group. Among the most popular tools are the X card, a simple card with an X that anyone can touch to skip the current scene or topic, and lines and veils, which lay out certain things that shouldn't be included in any session, and those that can be included to some degree, but should be handled with appropriate sensitivity. These tools, among many others, are simple but important ways of making sure that everyone is able to enjoy the experience. It goes without saying that you should respect everyone at your table, and ensure that all players treat each other with the same respect and kindness. People should always come before your game your world or your story. No ifs, no buts. Unlike many other tabletop games, role-playing games are less about achieving victory, scoring the most points, or trying to be the best at something. Those things can be a part of an RPG. Everyone wants the party to eventually complete their quest in one way or another, unless you're playing something deliberately tilted toward disaster like Fiasco or Call of Cthulhu. But the thread that runs through everything is the story. While some groups may play certain RPGs for their crunchy combat, most will be playing to tell a memorable story with friends. And as GM, you're there to make sure that that story is the very best that it can be. As we've mentioned throughout this video, do whatever will tell the best story for your group. Even if that means bending or breaking the rules, cheating behind the screen, or going completely off-piste from what you originally planned. You're not an audiobook or a rulebook in a human suit, you're a GM. Use the rules, your own notes and direction from the players to come up with the most exciting, interesting and unforgettable story that you can together. At the end of the day, it's less a game than a collaborative storytelling exercise. 
in years to come, you won't remember if you got the calculation for armor class and wisdom saving throws exactly right, but you will remember that time that the group took down a fearsome foe and taught their way out of, or more often into, a lot of danger. Hi, I'm Mike Mason, Call of Cthulhu Creative Director at Chaosium. Many years ago, I was a player in the very first edition of Masks of Nialahotep. And uh, during that campaign, um, uh, one of uh, my companions was a character called Jimmy, played by my good friend Dave. Uh, Jimmy liked to collect all of the Mythos tomes and all of the player handouts and all the information we gathered during the course of the campaign. Uh, which is very useful you know he looked after it all and whenever we had a question we just asked him and he would look it up and tell us the answer um, so it came as a bit of a shock one day when jimmy wasn't there uh, and dave declared that jimmy had run off in the middle of the night with all of our information and all of the mythos tomes to go and become a hermit in the middle of nowhere where he could study all this information for the rest of his life uh, leaving us all somewhat in the lurch with no access to any of the information that we needed for the rest of the campaign. Despite that, we did muddle through, uh, and uh, but we did come to a bit of a, a, a messy end when we discovered this glowing green rock on this ship. And we thought it'd be really good uh, to stow away on the ship so we could then steal the rock or, or kind of destroy it because we thought it was some sort of magical thing. Little did we know that a few hours later we'd all die from radiation poisoning. Uh, because the rock was uh, full of radiation. Um, putting a pretty much an end to that particular um, chapter in the campaign, um, as you can tell, we we really didn't do very well uh, in that particular run through of the campaign. Um, and uh, you know, we learned some hard lessons, as in never, never give all your books to one of the characters so they can run away with it all. But uh, you know, such things you learn as you play. It might seem a bit ironic to say this at the end of a video full of tips on how to do something, but there's no right way to play an RPG. Every RPG is different, and every group and GM is different. As long as your group has a fun time together and everyone feels happy and satisfied when you wrap up for the day, you're doing things right. Like the rules in a rulebook, follow our advice as much as it makes sense for you and your group. Tweak things to suit the way you play, and ignore anything that just doesn't work rather than feeling you have to do something in a particular way. After all, it's your game. Experiment, try some things and see what works. With every session, you and your group will learn what fits best with the people around the table and build your confidence as players and a GM. Even when something doesn't go quite as planned, embrace it. You look back on it one day, laugh, maybe, and see how far you've come. The only right way to play is a way that you'll all enjoy. Remember that and you'll be fine. There we have it. 13 tips to make your next RPG session and everyone after that the very best it can be. Thanks to all our guests for their fantastic stories. Be sure to check out their games, content and follow them on social media for more role-playing advice and inspiration. And if you're after more advice on playing role-playing games or just wondering what to play next, you can find us on dicebreaker.com, youtube.com slash dicebreaker or follow us on Twitter at joindicebreaker. We even have our own Dungeons & Dragons series, Dungeon Breaker, if you're interested in seeing how we play and having a few laughs along the way. But until we meet again, happy role-playing and have a lovely day.